How to deal with our own human behavior is a question fascinating me for more than three decades. And when it comes to the art of investigating the facts, interviews are one of the, the core disciplines with the inherent challenge of human behavior on different levels. If you are in the situation of conducting important interviews, the following minutes might be of interest. Great to have you here. Corporate integrity, fraud, non-compliance, and cybersecurity. Would you like to understand the root causes, detect threats, and take measurements to protect the most precious assets? As a leader, you need to be prepared and stay actionable in the event of an incident. Sonia Sternemann talks in her podcast, The Human Factor, Corporate Integrity Matters. To leaders and entrepreneurs who want to have impact, foster corporate integrity, and act as role models. As an international expert for corporate governance and integrity, entrepreneur, and independent board member, she knows the challenges. Let her inspire you. Welcome back to this new episode of the podcast, The Human Factor, Corporate Integrity Matters. You might be a board member, an executive, an investigator, an auditor, internal or external, or in short, a corporate integrity leader, or on your way there. What we have all in common is we strive for leadership with integrity. I'm your mentor and sparring partner when it comes to corporate integrity with impact, founder of corporate integrity concepts with the different formats for corporate integrity leadership and the vision to protect and secure assets, reputation and actionability, yours and the one of your organizations. Why? Because corporate integrity matters to all of us. How often do we get in our own way? And how often don't we even know about it? Conducting interviews is more than just having a conversation. And when I was asked by the ACFE whether I could speak at the European conference and outline the challenges of human behavior a few years ago, the answer was pretty clear as there is a real need out here. Interestingly, the need becomes bigger the more interviews we do and the more experience we gain. We all know the famous quote by Socrates saying, the more I know, the more I realize I know nothing. Same when it comes to our own human behavior in the interview process. And as I am a professional mediator too, no, not meditation, even though I like to meditate, <laughs> asking questions is in my DNA. Also mediators ask a lot of questions to understand the situation and the positions. Of the parties. Most of the time we meet our interviewee the first time and will not have a second chance. But today we are not talking about the right timing of conducting an interview in an investigation, not at all. We took that up already in episode 14 and in 44 already and we'll also deepen it in our free webinars and the upcoming workshops. So I'm convinced that understanding the power of human behavior in interviews is one of the key success factors for individuals in charge with the interview process. Of course, not only when it comes to the interviews. Focusing the team members on their own potential biases and behaviors as well as the investigated parties allows the team to see the full picture. For example, by applying dedicated interview methods these elements turn into effective tools. The perspectives and tools from different disciplines like sociology, criminology, psychology, communication and finance enable professionals to combine, establish and implement powerful best practices for interviewing. We don't know what we don't know, but we can make a step into more clarity and transparency by asking the right questions in the right setting, and even more factors for an effective interview process. My peer, also an executive board member, asked me to bring up the topic of interviews, our own behavior here in the podcast. He also told me that he's using this input for his own weekly reflection, refreshing what he learned in the past and gathering input for his team. That is exactly what I would like to provide here. I'm absolutely aware that most of the topics are not new, but may be taken up from a different perspective, in a different context, and with other use cases than the ones we already know. 
Thank you for letting me know that you use your input for your inspiration. So um, you exactly know out there who I mean with that. As communication is not new, we often think it doesn't need to be learned, but stop. That is not what I believe in, but that is one of the hindering beliefs I recognize when I talk to executives. It doesn't mean that someone is automatically a great communicator when she or he reached a certain level, especially when it comes to the interview process during an investigation. Interviews are a format to gather information. At least two people communicate with each other, all bringing their own behavior at the table, or at least virtually in these times. And with our individual human behavior, we also invite all our biases. When you would ask me who should reflect on their biases when it comes to interviews, my answer would be everybody and on an ongoing basis. I'm always fascinated by observing how other people try to gather information. Just a few days ago, I had a business meeting set up informally with no communicated agenda, but also without communicating it, I knew there is always an agenda, at least a hidden one. My approach in such situations is to put myself into the observer role and to try to stay on a meta level as much as possible. It's not always easy, but I try to. And of course, you can't do that during the entire conversation, but being aware of the different levels we have as an option, it supports you to understand the strategy and goals of your conversation partner. 80% of the time, I listen. Fair enough, it's one of my core skills. And after the meeting, where I also other people were involved, I realized that what I take for granted is not clear for everybody. The biases are all around, and by not being aware of them, it can negatively impact our goal of gathering the information we would like to have and we want to have and we need to have for our evidence. From the Stone Age to the evolution of communication, you cannot not communicate. And after having found a language, we started to put our words into pictures and fonts. Reflecting on the last 40 years in our life, what kind of technology did we let in? And are the other are there people listening to this episode not recognizing the old fax machine anymore? I think so, because the generations changes. The potential channels expanded by far. And we lose focus often and the ability to concentrate and focus on what is really key in our conversations. Distraction is what drives us, but can that be successful and goal-oriented? Not for us being in charge as professionals. It highly impacts our interviews we conduct and the results. An interview is a question-answer communication. Two-way, with the goal to achieve information. Compared to an ordinary conversation, the interview is structured and not just a free form and designed for a purpose. When we go into an interview, we have a plan. We need to have a plan. It does not mean that we need to to have everything set before or every single question. We have to dance with the interviewee. This dancing with the client is a very successful communication methodology, but no, but needs to be trained. I call it strategic focus dancing with the goal. Just a quick reflection back to you. Do you keep yourself flexible and strategically focused to the goal during an investigative interview? Do you invite your biases to show up? Okay, what I mean by, evi by inviting of the biases, I want, I want to see them all, really all, because if I'm not in contact with my biases, I cannot change it, and especially I cannot manage it. And the quick refresher with regards to the biases, we look at those in different ways, the conscious ones and the unconscious ones. Both types include stereotypes, pre-justice, and discrimination. Today, I'm not going to the various F um, different types, but would like to focus on the biases as such. More details are discussed during the trainings and webinars and workshops and whatever you can have um, from my side. 
So the, contra the conscious bias is the one perceived by the affected person and the correspond corresponding one is under control and thus able to adapt to the situation. In our case, the examiner, appraiser or investigator knows about it. Often, these conscious biases go together with the occurrence of the so-called conflict of interest. In most cases, conscious biases result from the following constellations, family relationships, financial relationships, personal relationships, friendship partners, industrial relations, current ones or in the past, business relations, customer suppliers, and past experiences. Focusing on the unconscious implicit bias her owner is unaware of the influence. That means the owner can do this embarrassment in hindsight already a few moments later, but not now in which the influence of the bias takes place. Research shows that people are much more unconscious as they can admit. In turn, for the peculiarity of the unconscious and not further astonished, numerous case studies prove that existence and effects of this implicit bias, even though this may sound extremely dramatic and con contradictory, unconscious bias is not only bad. You know why? The ab ability to quickly judge if an animal could be dangerous or not, whether a person is good or bad-minded, brings benefits. Likewise, this corresponds to the natural survival mechanism of humans and animals. These quick assessments are unconscious or with very little awareness. Although these positive effects persist, they can be during a test or diverge them diametrically from a determination and affect the results accordingly. And that's not what we need to have. For example, if the investigator during an investigation, due to his or her bias, is completely transferred into the mental offside without facing the phenomenon to be aware, he or she would not realize that this was due to his or her bias sticks to an idea that is not related to the professional fulfillment of, of his or her task and the responsibility they have right now. This could harm the entire investigation. As an example, a young investigator receives an information from his supervisor that person X stands under suspicion 14 million Swiss francs over a period of eight years are misappropriated. Evidence was not available now and the facts should be investigated. The supervisor mentions the cultural background of the suspect in the form of a value-free value facts based on a background analysis. But the younger investigator remembers a negative meeting with the compatriot of the suspect. He was then just 15 years old. The movie in the head of the investigator, the young investigator, runs automatically and therefore unconsciously. As cavemen, this unconscious knowledge of possible danger when you meet animal XYZ can save your life. But experts should not be influenced by it at work especially not when it doesn't go together with that situation right now. The movie I mentioned before was already 20 years back. We all know what it means to be unaware of biases when we have enough time to think about, but often people are under pressure, exhausted and not aware enough. So coming back to the two types of biases, the conscious and the unconscious one, we know that the unconscious bias affects, for example, the search for evidence, how we ent interpret the facts, the interview suspects and formulate the conclusions. A misjudgment based on unconscious bias has far-reaching implications and consequences for the involved parties. The goal in the professional environment of crisis and anti-fraud management is especially in the interviewing process where biases are within different parties to recognize biasness as such. No critical aspects of what parts of an exam or determination could be affected and being able to initiate measures to reduce these different biases. When it comes to the interview process during an investigation, we have to make sure that the entire team remembers their own biases. The conscious ones, for sure, but also think about the unconscious. 
The Integrity Talk following in next week's episode with Melanie Shong will also touch the important part of conducting professional interviews, not only when it comes to the investigative part. This was episode number 48, The Human Factor Corporate Integrity Matters with a lot of information when it comes to the biases in interviews. Following the motto, corporate integrity secures and empowers individuals and organizations. Thank you for listening. My name is Sonja Stiernemann and I'm your host. Stay curious, actionable and the role model. Take care and goodbye. Would you like to learn more, meet peers and getting qualified? So visit the website Corporate Integrity Concepts or Corporate Integrity Academy. Or do you think this podcast could be interesting for someone you know? Sharing is caring and we are always happy to welcome your peers to our community. And if you like this episode, subscribe and don't miss any of the future ones. The show notes are, of course, enriched with relevant information and your connection via any of the social media channels is highly appreciated and will be answered. Promised. And please do not forget, Topics of your interest or interview partners are highly welcome. Just send me a note on any of the channels you know.